Okay. So yeah, as I've mentioned, we are going to record this this evening. So if you are in a place where you shouldn't be, now will be the time to turn your camera off. Equally, if there are minors with an OR, not an ER, in the vicinity, um, you might want to uh, turn your camera off. Um, and also, if you are, I don't know, in bed naked, again, same mm -hmm. applies. So be aware that oh, other people can see you. And we I'm are doing that so. Amber, if you mute everyone, just give me a bit of a wave because I need to keep an eye to make sure I don't get muted as well. Um, Okie dokie. So yeah, let's just make sure you're in the right place. You're at my webinar, my masterclass tonight. Um, uh, my name's Heidi, I'm from EOTAS Matters. Um, the webinar this evening is entitled, My Kid Can't Go to School, I'm Overwhelmed and I Might Be About to Lose My Shit help and I think it captured people's imagination because we've had an overwhelming response and loads of people booking on so um, I wanted to give you a little bit of a heads up of what to expect this evening um, <clears throat> and then I'll take you through the masterclass um, so if you haven't come across me before I think most people will have done but if you haven't come across me before you'll know that I run webinars fairly regularly and um, often our webinars do include a Q&A tonight's will be a little different and um, so let me explain what's going to happen so There'll be a short introduction. I'm going to talk to you a little bit towards the end of the session tonight about how you can work with me. Um, and with your permission, I'll do that at the end. But before we do that, I'm going to share some stuff with you about, you know, like kind of like my survival guide for what to do when your children aren't in school. Because I know from personal experience and from supporting families how incredibly stressful that can be and incredibly difficult it can be and how taxing it can be for a family. So we're going to cover some of that tonight. Uh, the chat is open, but I'm not looking at the chat because I find it too distracting. Amber will keep an eye on it for me. But this evening's session is really me sharing my top tips. Um, and then at the end, I'll tell you a little bit about what else I've got to offer you with your permission. You'll be able to take some of the stuff that I share with you away with you tonight and start using it straight away. Um, and I really hope it's helpful to you. Um, when we get later on in the session, if you've got questions about the stuff I talked to you about later on, then please do feel free to do that. But in terms of questions around provision, EHCPs, EOTAS, anything like that, the best place to do that is in our Facebook group. So I will post a link to that. And when you get the replay, you'll also get a link for that tonight, because there are just too many of us tonight to, for me to be able to facilitate a full Q&A around that. Okay. So with your permission, give me waves if that sounds all right, give me thumbs up, we'll get cracking. Um, don't feel that you have to have your cameras on, but if you have got them on and I ask you to do things, then do it. Otherwise, I feel like I'm just speaking to an empty room. I'm looking at you, Agnesha Gonzalez. What a very exciting name. Hello. Um, and I've got a thumbs up from Gillian Rellin. Thank you, Gillian, or Gillian Rellin. Okay, so let's go for it. I can see that we've still got people in the uh, waiting room and Amber's going to let them in. Uh, Okie dokie, let's go for it. So let me tell you a little bit about me and what to expect tonight. My buttons aren't working. There's the sod's law in it here. This is me. So um, all the illustrations that you'll see tonight in this evening's presentation have been done by my son. My son, Theo, is 17. He's autistic, PDA, ADHD. He's an incredible human and people who follow me will know him and probably love him almost as much as I do, if, as if that were possible. Um, just a bit of background. I'm not going to get too much into our history, but the reason I do the work that I do is that Theo got through school okay and then in high school hit a major bump in the road and at the time we didn't realize that he was neurodivergent um, I didn't realize there was anything different about him and the reason I didn't realize there was anything different about him is because he is just like me and I didn't realize that I was neurodivergent which is a really common experience for lots of families I think so when he got to 14 he hit a significant mental health crisis and went from being a child who was really well engaged really happy or appeared to be really happy, um, was always anxious, but hadn't really presented in the way it did. And then we went from kind of really good full attendance to zero attendance in school within about half a term. And then what followed was almost two and a half years of not being able to be in school at all. Um, and I went from thinking I had nothing to worry about to feeling like I had everything to worry about and had to really quickly find out everything I could about what could be going for, on for him. And then we kind of made the discovery and the realization that he was autistic and PDA and ADHD. And then I pursued an EHCP. And um, all the while I had a child who was too unwell to even leave his bedroom. He didn't leave the house for 18 months. It was really scary. Um, and it had a massive impact on myself and on him. Um, I'm a single parent. 
you know, it's been me and him pretty much on our own since he was two years old. And I was terrified and it had a huge impact on me personally. And I've spoken about it pretty openly. So when we kind of came out the other side of that, we couldn't find a setting that could take him. He had some time in a pupil referral unit, which was actually really successful. It was a pupil referral unit for children with uh, medical needs, but specifically social, emotional, mental health needs. And that's where he finishes GCSEs. Um, and then we've had a year of education otherwise than at school. So we've had a year of a bespoke package funded through the local authority. And it's been an absolute lifesaver for us. And the majority of the work that I do is in supporting parents who want to pursue that route. Um, so I have a Facebook group. I also have a membership that I run with the OTAS, with um, Centre Family Instincts called the OTAS Instincts, where we support families who are pursuing that route through the EHCP process in England. When we got out of the other side of that and we both started to recover, I kind of felt like I wish that I'd known the things that I know now when, when, when we were going through that. And my history previously is that um, I'm a trauma-informed coach. Um, I'm a mental health first aider. One of my passions is mental health and suicide prevention. And I really wanted to kind of use that to support families. So the work that I do now is around educating and enabling families to safely advocate for their children at the same time as taking good care of themselves. And that's what I do. So tonight, I'm going to share with you my 10 top tips, my 10 trauma-informed top tips to go from wrung out warrior to unstoppable sen warrior. These are like my observations. These are the things that I wish that people had told me. And we're going to rattle through them. And then with your permission at the end, I'm going to tell you about something new that we've got from EOTAS Matters, which is our Unstoppable Parents program, which we're going to open the doors on this evening. Okay, so... Where should we start? Let's start with number one. <laughs> My first top tip for making sure that you do not lose your shit is that you absolutely must trust your gut. And this is really difficult when you're up against professionals, senkos, teachers, head teachers, you know, meaning, you know, well-meaning other adults, well-meaning other parents, friggin' super nanny, um, you know, who are telling you that your approach is wrong and that what you're thinking about your child is wrong. And I wish that I had felt more emboldened and enabled and empowered to really trust what my gut was telling me from the beginning. For those of you who are neurodivergent, you'll know that we do have that. I mean, all of us have that kind of sixth sense, but I think those of us who are autistic or neurodivergent or ADHD, we seem to have this underlying kind of like questioning of that because we're so used to being invalidated um, and we're so used to having our experiences questioned and challenged and I really wish that I had felt more empowered earlier on and when people ask me what shall I do generally my first answer to them is what is your gut telling you you can always trust your gut all day every day you can't always hear it and you don't always believe what it's saying to you but absolutely please do lean into that you cannot go far wrong if you start with that as a beginning and people will challenge you and they will tell you that you're wrong you know your child better than anyone else on this planet you may not be an educational psychologist but you can be damn sure what you think what they need and um, so please do make sure that you drill down into that and we'll talk a little bit about how you can do that second one kind of leads on from this listen to your child so important so many people have experiences where their children are communicating with them not necessarily even verbally or with spoken word behavior is communication if your child is having is experiencing distress is having difficulty getting to school is having difficulty moving around in school is having you know distressing meltdowns or panic attacks around accessing education they are telling you something um, and I would really encourage you to listen very carefully and to watch very carefully what your child is communicating one of the biggest challenges is when you have a child who has particularly emotional based school avoidance they can't tell you what is wrong they just know that they are they don't want to go to school and you will have people telling you well nobody wants to go to school in my day blah, blah, blah. this is not just a I can't be bothered to go to school situation children who experience school-based trauma and emotional-based school avoidance are in a mental health crisis and it's really vital that we validate their experiences and their feelings and one of the biggest things for me during this experience was I remember having a moment with Theo, that's my son, and we had tried to manage move and we'd gone to a new setting and it had been disastrous um, for, for all of the same reasons that the other setting was disastrous. School 
at the time was just not a work for him. It was too noisy, too many people, too much sensory overwhelm, too much pressure, too much exhaustion, too much masking. He just couldn't manage it. And we'd had this disastrous morning at a managed move and we got back in the car and came home. And the following morning, I managed to persuade him to get into his uniform and get him in the car. And after many tears and he never had violent tantrums, as you might expect, what people expect a meltdown to present as. But he had what you would could, what you would say looked like extreme distress and kind of panic attacks behavior. But very, very, very upset and unconsolable. And that's what a meltdown looked like for Theo for a long time. And we'd had that and I got him in the car and we got to the school and I said, right, come on, let's, you know, let's give it a go. Um, Cause he had said to me in the morning, I really want to try this mum." And it was never about whether he wanted to or not. It was always about whether he could or not. When children want to and are able to, they will, um, is in my experience. And I would really encourage you to remember that. So we were sat in the car and I said, come on then, let's get out the car. And he was like, I don't want to, I don't want to. And start getting upset. I was like, listen, you don't have to do anything. Let's just get out of the car. And he looked at me and he was upset and he said, mom, what's it going to take for you to actually listen to me? And I was like, fuck, sorry. I'm not sorry. I use a language sometimes. I'm autistic. But I had that moment when I was like, and I had this realization that if I kept doing this, not only was I telling him that his no didn't mean no, which was really like invalidating his experience and telling him that consent was not important, but I was going to erode my trust. And I knew that if of all the things that we needed, he needed to trust me. And that was the moment when I realized we weren't going to do this anymore. And we never, ever went back to our school again. And in fact, he never went back into a mainstream setting after that. So please do listen to your child and please don't give yourself a hard time about not having listened to them previously or not knowing what to hear. You know, I am a trauma informed practitioner and it's really important that you don't use this as a stick to beat yourself with. We can all do that. I wish I'd done this sooner. You know, we, and if you've got a child who tells you what they think, your kid will tell you that too. I wish you'd done this sooner. Oh yeah, thanks kid. But please don't use that as a stick to beat yourself with. You don't know what you don't know, but please do feel empowered to listen to your children and to read those cues. And like I said, to trust them and to trust your gut. Okay, next one. Get informed. Really important that you seek out information that's going to be helpful to you. Everyone will have an opinion. Everyone will be able to tell you what their opinion is. Lots of people want to tell you what their opinion is, even when you don't ask for it. But you want to be discerning about who you, who and where you seek information. So some really great places online. I always recommend Ipsy. It's a great place for information, I-P-S-E-A. It's a free online platform. It's like a, a special educational need Bible for people. So I always recommend Ipsy. I also always recommend Send Family Instincts. They're a paid for service, but I partner with them and they, have, they were incredible when we needed them. They offer really low cost support and advocacy services. I, I would also recommend that you get yourself into local groups. If you're not already in our EOTAS group, I'll make sure that you get a link for that. But um, local groups for families who are experiencing similar to what you're experiencing is, is invaluable. So maybe even home ed groups, even if you're not home edding, um, you know, or um, local parent care forums and do lean into those local services. All your local authorities will have a Sendias service. It's a free service. It's impartial. It's part funded by the local authority. So some people do find that difficult and not all Sendias workers are created equal. That said, Sendias knowledge in terms of what is happening locally and and local offer can be really, really, really valuable. Do not underestimate how much you will need to up knowledge and upskill yourself in this process. I think you go into this and you maybe hit a bit of a crisis and your child can't be in school and you maybe like I did naively think, oh, well, now that we know that my child's got difficulties, then people will help us. And actually, unfortunately, that doesn't always follow. So be ready to become a bit of a a bit of a special educational need law geek and seek out that information and help and advice and be discerning about who you take that advice from. So get yourself informed. Make sure your voice is heard. I hear from families all the time that they've had a conversation with, for example, the head of year or a head teacher or a SENCO, and that person has said to them, as a for instance, oh, you'll never get any HCP. Um, and then they've gone, oh, all right then. And then they feel like they can't speak up again. They feel like they can't advocate for their children. I'm not saying you have to be an absolute pain in the backside, although I think I probably was, 
but do not be afraid to speak up you know do not be afraid to push back do not be afraid to give yourself permission to become a bit of a pain in the ass if you need to because sometimes that is what's required you don't have to be really pushy and I know people sometimes are like oh yeah but everyone you're not you're very confident, you know, but I got this way by needing to be this way, you know, it's, it's a choice. Um, and I would really kind of want to say to people, you know, you never got through a door that says push on it without at least leaning on it gently. So you do need to do that for yourself and you do need to get yourself into a place and with a circle of support around you where you can speak up and you can advocate for your child and you can ask questions and you can query things. And if pe people say things to you that you don't agree with, you can go back to them and say, can I just check with you? I, I think you said this and I'm not quite sure what that meant. One of the biggest examples of this, one of the best examples of this is when you're calling school to tell them that your child cannot attend and I know that parents call up and say you know they're really struggling they're refusing they won't get out of bed I can't get them up I can't get them into their uniform you know all of this do not be afraid to say my child is not well enough to be in school today please mark them as absent under code I for illness on the register you know stand your ground that your child is not well mental health is as debilitating if not more so than physical health and Whereas educators may feel that the best place for our children is in school, many of us know by trusting our gut that when our children are in crisis, that is certainly not the case. So do speak up. And if you can't speak up for yourself, have someone speak up for you or with you. You know, if you're going to meetings, take someone with you, even if it's, you know, Doris from next door, but one who doesn't even, you know, know anything about SEND, just take someone with you to sit in a seat and eyeball the SENCO if that's going to make you feel empowered. So make sure you get your voice heard. Trust no one. Now there is a caveat with this. Don't trust no one, but be very careful about who you take advice from and whether you, I, I'm saying, you know, not really, but do be discerning whether you believe everything that is said to you. And this is particularly true if you're in the EHCP process. You will be told things by professionals who you trust because of their position and they will either give you inaccurate or dishonest advice and information and that's just the way that is and like what the reason for that is is all kinds of things you know if it's a local authority caseworker it might be because you know they're under a they're on a quota for the amount of ehcps that are issued you know if it's a senko they've maybe got no budget left if it's um you know if it's a class teacher they don't want to get into trouble because they realize that their send training isn't up to scratch whatever it might be people have their own agenda and it's not necessarily born out of um malice or trying to hurt you or your child, but it's certainly not born out of them wanting, needing, and pushing to get the very best that you and your family need. And also sometimes it's born out of people not knowing. And this is particularly true when it comes to if you're asking for education otherwise than at school. There's a lot of information, misinformation out there. There's a lot of like misunderstanding out there. There's a lot of, you know, local local authority policies that are actually unlawful and are in contradiction to the statutory guidance so just because someone says you can't have something or that isn't a thing or there's no such thing as or actually what you should be doing is do check go back to the place where you're getting informed and check that information get into our group get into send family instincts if you're a member with them get onto the ipsy website double check 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 everything that you're being told and the other thing that follows on from the trust no one thing is make sure you make good notes and make sure you have good records. And if my personal thing is I don't take phone calls. So because if someone says something to me on the phone, I have no way of a remembering it because I'm ADHD. So I will totally forget what was said. Even if I write it down, my notes will make no sense at all. Um, or I will not be able to prove that that's what they said. So whenever I have a phone call, I ignore it <laughs> and I usually get the voice note and I send an email back saying, I'm ever sorry I couldn't take your call. I actually, as a reasonable adjustment, ask people to communicate with me in writing because of my attention differences. Please, could you send me an email and I'll come back to you? Or if you do have a conversation with someone on the phone, one of two things, either follow it up straight after with an email while you're on the phone, be typing what they're saying and just say, I just want to make these notes of what we've just discussed. This is what we covered. Can you just let me know if any of this is not accurate and pop it on an email to them or make a recording of that phone call? And you can do that. You are legally entitled to make a recording of any conversations if it's just for your own record. Um, and when it comes to meetings, I always ask for meetings to be recorded and I always either do it on Zoom or on Teams. And I say, please can we record this meeting so that I can have it for my notes and for my records. 
In terms of recording people without their permission, you can do that if it's simply for record keeping, but you can't share it. So you would be in breach of data protection if you did. But in my experience, if you ask people if you can record a meeting and they say no, you probably don't want to have that meeting. So yeah, be discerning about whose advice and information you take. A really good example of this is that when my son was out of school, I kept saying, surely there must be something for him. You know, like he can't be in school, but he does want to learn. There must be something, there must be something, there must be something. And, you know, the SENCO and the educational welfare officer were like, no, no, there's nothing, there's nothing. And I was speaking at an event and someone came up to me afterwards. It was a local event. And they said, they kind of sidled up to me in a very like cloak and dagger kind of way and said, have you heard of Renthorpe PRU? And I was like, no, what's that? And then they told me, and then I called the educational welfare officer. Well, I actually called the PRU the following day and said, do you take kids who can't be in school because of mental health needs? And they were like, yes, we do. And I was like, how do I get my kid in with you? And then that was the ball rolling for getting a place at the PRU. They all knew it existed. They all knew it was there. They all knew how to access it. I was asking, there must be something, there must be something. But until I actually said, what about Renthorpe PRU? And they went, oh yeah, we'd forgotten about Renthorpe PRU. No, you hadn't. So yeah, trust no one. Make sure you get good local advice and good local information. And when you're when you're in that situation, other parents are a really good resource. Give yourself permission to say no. Um, when you are a neurodivergent adult, especially, and I know that we have a lot of a lot of neurodivergent adults or neurodivergent considering adults in in the mix tonight it can be really difficult we are used to being told that our wants our wishes our desires our brains our hopes our communication style our behavior is wrong and um, we are used to going along with things that make us feel uncomfortable even without even knowing we're doing that we are used to tempering our um reactions and we are used to saying yes and we are not very good at saying no. And until we absolutely have to, and then, you know, we have that Coke bottle effect and the wheels come off and then we have to go to bed for three days, for example. Do start empowering yourself and practicing saying no. Do start challenging yourself around what your boundaries look, look like. It's really important when your child is out of school, if you really do feel and you're trusting your gut and you're listening to your child, that it's not in their best interest to be in school, that when a professional says to you, you do need to get them into school, you're able to say to them, I don't need to get them into school. I have a legal responsibility to ensure that they are accessing an education and they are educated. That does not mean that I have to send them to school if they're not well. So part of learning to say no and being okay with saying no is knowing why you're saying no and having the things to back that up. And that's when kind of um, having the knowledge of what your rights are is really important. But also when it comes to those boundaries, if you've got a child at home and if you're not able to do lots of things, you will have to say no to lots of things. And it's better to say no by choice than by necessity. So it's better, for example, if you know that things are going to have to change for you as a family, even if it's temporarily, for you to get ahead of that and make those decisions. So, for example, uh, it's not ideal and I don't wish it on anyone, but many parents, one or both parents, if you're living in a two parent household, will have to give up work when they've got their child at home for any extended length of time. And part of saying no is making that decision at the right time for you and your family. Um, so it's not just being like difficult. It's about establishing some boundaries and working out what works best for you and your family. Um, but do practice saying no and do remind yourself and we cover this in the unstoppable parent program do remind yourself that no is a complete sentence you do not owe anyone an explanation for why you can't do something you're allowed to just say i won't be doing that but thanks for the offer that really annoys senkos when you say that um so we're into some of theo's illustrations uh, the next one is put on your own oxygen mask we hear this all the time this is his illustration <laughs> When he did this, the person on the floor, I thought that was a beard. It's not. They're going blue. Um, so it shows a little bit of his dark sense of humor. God love him. But it is. we hear this all the time. And I, the, one of the things that I hear from parents all the time is, you know, I know I should be looking after myself. I know I should be resting. I know our lovely Amber, who's facilitating for us this evening, is a really good example of this. And I am too. I have a chronic fatigue condition because I didn't look after myself. And not because I chose to, but because I just did not have the capacity. 
But it is really important that if you want to be able to advocate for your children or for your child, that you need to take care of yourself first. Now, that does not mean spa days, because God knows when you've got a kid at home who won't leave their bedroom, the last thing that you're able to do is leave the house and go out for a shoulder, neck and back massage. But it does mean occasionally having a piss with the bathroom door open, uh, not open. Or, you know, it does mean having a walk around the block if that's something you want to do or it does mean having an hour to watch love island or i don't know i'm thinking about other things that people like none of those things are my things i like weeing with the door shut but you know <laughs> that's even a luxury in our house but it does mean that you want to work out what it is that's going to top your energy levels up what it is that's going to refresh you what's going to energize you what's going to support you who do you need around you for those times when you do feel like you're about to lose your marbles and you just need people to gather you up and take care of you? What does that look like for you? Everyone's oxygen mask is different. And if you are a neurodivergent adult, but even if you're not, understanding your own sensory profile is really important because then you can make sure that you're doing things to self-soothe and you're doing things to reduce your trauma response, which is really key when you're going through this process because we are all, whether we choose to or not, at some level or another, we will be traumatized by this experience. And when I say traumatized, I just mean that it will have a lasting effect on the way that you view yourself, the world, your child, the law, the government. You know, it does. It's, it's a life changing experience when your child cannot do something that you that everyone's child does like as a, as a standard. So do take the time to think about what it would look like for you to get really good at taking care of yourself. Um, it's not selfish. It's absolutely essential. And I'll say that, trigger warning, as someone who experienced suicidal uh, feelings as a result of going through this process. And I'm someone who is a mental health first aider. I'm really good at taking care of myself. And I found it incredibly stressful and find myself in a doctor's surgery the day before Christmas Eve saying, I'm really worried that I might do something. Please help me. Number eight is prioritize. So this comes back to self-care as well, but everything actually. When we're going through the process of trying to advocate for our children and trying to work out what their education will look like, whether that's going to be in school or whether you're going to unschool or deregister or whether you're pursuing EOTAS or whether you're getting an EHCP or whether you know, whatever it might look like. The professionals around you may think that the priority should be for your child to be back in school. And I would really challenge that. The priority for us as a family was my child's well-being first and foremost. It was his mental health and it was his recovery. And then secondary to that was my mental health and my recovery. Whether he went back to school or not was quite a long way down our list of priorities, but I had to make the effort to do that shuffling because when this first happens, you are told by everybody, your kid must be in school, they must be in school, you've got to get them back into school. That's got to be the number one priority. Doesn't it even matter if they're sat in a corridor at a desk not learning for three terms. If they're in school, we can tick that box and it won't affect our Ofsted rating. And that is what it comes down to for many schools. Um, just kind of why schools are so kind of like fixed on attendance. There's a couple of reasons. First of all, it's embedded in the Education Act. So it's kind of part of the way that education works is that there's this narrative, um, whether you agree with it or not, that the best place and the best way for children to learn is in school. You may have what might be considered radical views that don't agree with that, but that is generally how the education system is set up. The second reason why attendance is so important is because particularly if your school is an Ofsted rated excellent school, outstanding, sorry, or if it's part of a multi-academy trust, you'll find this. Attendance is something that Ofsted look at when they're doing their visits. And if they haven't got over a particular level of attendance, they will never get an outstanding Ofsted report. And outstanding Ofsted reports are what schools and multi-academy trusts especially want. And that's why they push you so hard on attendance. And that's why, you know, I've had conversations, and I know many parents have had this experience where they've said to you, oh, well, um, it doesn't really matter. Just get them in you know, and, oh, well, they've said to you, well, they're fine in school, you know, or they've said to you, you know, just, just bring them to, this is one of my bugbears, just bring them to touch the gate. If you've heard me talking about touch, touching the gate before, like it drives me mental, the touch the gate narrative, but it's a very common, let's just get them to touch the gate. Yeah. Cause that's going to help. But, you know, the priority of people who are around you may be to get your child back in school. And I would really empower you and challenge you and say to you, 
prioritize what really matters. Prioritize a healthy, well, happy, regulated child who understands themselves, who has time to rest, who has time to recover, who trusts you, who is safe and who feels safe. They have to be your priorities because if you don't do that or when you don't do that, that is when the wheels really can come off. And I know that that is really challenging, especially when you're up against, you know, the, the full weight of the threat of prosecution or, you know, attendance orders or, you know, social care involvement or wherever it might be. I know that that is not simple, but it is absolutely vital that you decide what your priorities are as a family and you stick to them and you say no when the things that you're being asked to do rub up against that. I'd really empower you to think about what your priorities are. Take your time. You will get emails. Uh, we have a bit of a joke in our group, in our IOTAS group, where we have a thread fairly often on a Friday. And on a Friday afternoon, we say, share with us your Friday afternoon half past four emails, because it seems like caseworkers in their bid to clear um, their caseload on a Friday afternoon, to clear their inbox, they fire a load of stuff out in the afternoon. And everyone gets a, an email that really annoys them at half past four on a Friday afternoon or upsets them or sometimes thrills them. You know, sometimes it's good news. But what I wanted to say about that is that I in my group, I talk about this and I and in the Unstoppable uh, Parent program, we talk about this. This is your time. Your time is precious. Your children will not be children forever. We talk about this all the time. Don't we say they grow up so quickly, but especially when your children are going through difficult times, you know, things can feel like a lot longer than they are. A week out of school when you're nine years old can feel like a long, long time. And you are allowed to take the time that it needs to do what is right for you and your family. So if you get an email at half past four on a Friday afternoon, you do not have to open it and you do not have to respond to it. You do not have to look at it until Monday because you can be damn sure the caseworker is not at home thinking, oh, that email I sent at half past four, all weekend worrying about it. So if you know that it's going to ruin your weekend, don't open emails after 12 on a Friday and tell people you don't. They can wait. The same applies to things like if you've got an EHCP draft, you've, you've got a minimum of 15 days to feedback on it. It's a minimum of 15 days. If you're stuck in a little bit of overwhelm or your children need you, or I don't know, it's not convenient, whatever it might be, you can say to them, I'm going to need more than 15 days. It's a minimum make sure that you are working on your own time. When you have a child at home who maybe is on a different sleep pattern, you might need to nap during the day. I nap every day at two o'clock, otherwise I wouldn't be able to function. Um, and I nap for two hours. That's not really a nap, is it? It's a proper nana sleep. But it's the only way that I can maintain my energy levels to just show up in the world. Um, it, you are on your own calendar and on your own clock. So do things that work for you and don't be afraid to hold that boundary. <clears throat> and number 10, I'm going to recap these for you, is upskill yourself. So that can look like all kinds of things, like some parents decide to go and do an Ipsy course in Send Law, so they really know what's going on for them. Some parents will seek out training in particular areas. So there's some really good training. For example, if you're a PDA parent, Nest um, have a really great PDA CPD approved training. Uh, Studio three have a really excellent low arousal training that you could get yourself on, which I think is free for parents. It runs on a Friday morning. There's loads of really great groups. There's tons of webinars. Um, Heidi Steele from Live, Play, Learn and Naomi Fisher run a really great program for parents who want to unschool. Um, the Nurture program run an excellent um, nurturing advocacy service where they have places where parents can share information and, and community. The uh, Send Family Instincts have really good services. You know, find out what you need to know. Like, I know you don't know what you need to know, but you know that there are gaps in your knowledge. Find out where those gaps are and then seek to fill those gaps. You don't have to go to university. I asked Theo to do me an illustration of someone learning, and this is what he came out with, but I freaking love it. And um, you'll see I've used it a lot. So let's recap. Whoa, let's not go too far. Okay. So this is my recap for you for your top 10 tips. Number one, trust your gut. Always, every time, you can always trust yourself. Please listen to what that inner voice is telling you. And if you can't hear that inner voice, think about how you maybe need to calm your brain and your nervous system so that you can. Number two, listen to your child. 
Look out for signs that they are communicating with you, even if they're not able to speak to you. I have a child who is situationally mute. When he was in crisis, he couldn't tell me how he felt. He also experiences um, alexithymia, so he doesn't know what feelings he's having. And he, like I, have delayed emotional responses. So something can happen to me in the morning and I will be in tears at half past nine at night and I have to think, what was that? Oh, that's what that was. So listen to your child. Look for what they're telling you and let their no mean no. If they say no, then that's a no. Like that's one of the strongest messages that you can send to your child is that your no means no with me. You can trust me. Um, if we teach our children that no doesn't mean no, we are setting them up for all kinds of like danger, especially our neurodivergent children. Get informed, find the places that have the knowledge that you need and go and seek out those experts, those parent professionals, those peer to peer groups, those communities, those Facebook groups, those forums, Go and find what you need to find and get your get it in your brain. Um, make sure your voice is heard. Don't be afraid to speak up. If someone says no to you, don't be afraid to ask again. And that applies to all things. Going back to panel more than once, if it's an EHCP decision, uh, you know, asking for an EHCP assessment more than once, appealing a refusal to uh, assess or appealing a refusal to issue. These are all things that you need to speak up with. Make your voice heard. Make sure that you're that you're advocating for your child in a way that's safe for you and for them. Trust no one, get everything in writing, record phone calls if you need to, record meetings if you need to, and um, don't take phone calls if that works for you. Um, give yourself permission to say no, work out what that feels like, get comfortable with feeling uncomfortable when you need to. Um, work out what you support you need around yourself to be able to say no when people say things to you or when people challenge you. If I had a pound for every time that somebody had said to me something like, oh, well, you know, all kids hate school, like I would be minted. Unfortunately, people don't give you money just for saying stupid things, because if they did, I'm sure we'd all be rolling in it by now, especially if you're a parent of the neurodivergent child. Like, ching, 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 ching. But give yourself permission to say no. Put on your own oxygen mask. Find a way to take care of yourself or let other people take care of you. Find out what it means to be applying a trauma-informed approach to your parenting, your life, your way of being. Learn what trauma looks like for you as an individual. Learn what your triggers are. Find out what your sensory profile is and find a way to soothe and to give your brain a rest. And um, you absolutely need to be able to do that for you. Having a child who is at home with you or is not able to attend school is desperately stressful. And regardless of what decision you make about what your next steps are, it is inherently traumatizing. Um, not to say that you'll be experiencing PTSD necessarily, but some of us do. And just to be aware that something that is traumatizing for one person is not traumatizing for another person. So really give yourself permission to think about, you know, it's okay for me to be feeling this way. You know, it's perfectly normal and natural. Given the, given the stimulus, given the experience I'm having, given the situation, given my personal history, how I'm feeling and what I'm experiencing now is completely understandable and it's okay. And find a way to make that safe for yourself and find a way to support yourself. If that means going and seeing a doctor and asking to be put on medication, do that. If that means seeking out you know, a trauma-based therapist, do that. If that means crying on your mother-in-law on a Sunday evening and covering a snot, do that. Whatever works for you, find a way, but make sure that you are taking care of yourself so that you can take care of your children. Prioritize, decide what your important things are, decide what you're gonna make sure is your non-negotiable. For me, my non-negotiable was, I will never put my child in a situation again when he asks me, what's it gonna take for my no to mean no? I'm not gonna do that to him ever again. That's non-negotiable. And that means that sometimes people get told that we're not gonna do things and that's okay. It also means that when we go places, people probably think that I'm overprotective, neurotic, wrapping him in cotton wool. I don't care. That's what he needs. That's my job. My job is not to appear to be inverted commas normal my job is to be his mum and to show up for him and to advocate for him so prioritize what that looks like for you it will be different for every family take your time don't open emails until friday until monday if they come after 12 o'clock on a friday if you know it's going to ruin your weekend take your time to feed back to people don't answer the phone if you don't want to or if you're not able to 
put things on emails instead of taking phone calls if that helps you find out what your works are but don't rush yourself and don't lose time with your children because you are swamped with paperwork take a bit of time out take a rest you know everyone else who's working on your case they get holiday and they get weekends off you are allowed to have a bit of downtime you are allowed to go and run around in the garden with your kids if you want to if that's something they can do you are allowed to sit under a blanket with your child and watch crap tv you are allowed to stay in bed all day if you need to duvet days are totally valid um and upskill yourself find out where those gaps are once you've worked out what the information is that you need, find out what you're missing. Now, sometimes that might mean that the thing that you're missing is actually not the things on the list around what the law is, what support there is, what legally we're entitled to, you know, what absence code should be. Sometimes the thing that you need to upskill yourself around is how do I actually finally give myself permission to take care of myself? How do I work out what my sensory profile is? How do I work out what looking, what, giving my brain a rest would look like? How do I work out what my priority is? You know, it, it's, an, it's a new experience as a parent to be going through this and you are not expected to know because you haven't been here before. I hope that's really helpful. I've, re I've gone like, blah, 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 blah. they're my 10 top tips. <clears throat> With your permission, I'd like to show you something else that the, uh, that the EOTAS instincts have, uh, EOTAS matters has for you. So this is new. And this is born out of the fact that when I started doing work for families and with families, the thing that was coming back to me over and over and over again was people needed that core information about what are our rights? What does the law says, say about attendance? You know, how can I get provision for my child who can't be in school? And once we'd covered that, the next question that was coming back was, that's all amazing, but how do I not drown in this process? How do I take care of myself? And I, that really rang a bell with me. And it was something that I really wanted to address with people because for me, that was a very real challenge and I've shared about it before. So the things that people really feel around this whole experience is they feel guilty and they feel full of shame. They feel guilty that they've let their children down. They feel guilty that they didn't spot things earlier. They feel guilty that they're you know, not doing a good job. They feel ashamed that they can't do what they think other parents are doing. And they really need to lean into taking good care of themselves and just getting much better at being compassionate with themselves. And so the Unstoppable Parent Programme is that. So it's a five week programme that I have written. It's actually an evolution of a program that I used to run when I used to coach businesses. I used to be a business coach and I used to coach disabled people starting new businesses. And one of the things that came out time and time and time again was again, people didn't need to know how to start a business. They needed to know how to fight the imposter syndrome. They needed to know, to know how to you know, speak publicly about their offer. They needed to know how to not spiral into overwhelm and they needed to know how to take really good care of themselves and to like do things like you know, understand what their relationship with money was like. It was that kind of stuff. So I wrote an unstoppable program for those people. The unstoppable parent program is an evolution of that, but it's layered with trauma-informed responses and it's layered with my experience as a neurodivergent adult who has experienced significant mental health challenges is a mental health first aider and is also really passionate about speaking openly and honestly and skilling parents with what they really need to survive this process so what is it it's a five-week trauma-informed neurodiversity affirming training and it's a community for parents and parents who basically don't want to lose their shit. <laughs> um, it will happen on Facebook. It's an exclusive Facebook community that I will host. Um, we start next Thursday, next Thursday, the 16th, is it? Yeah, 16th. Um, so there'll be a live training every Thursday night at either half past seven or eight o'clock. I'll poll the community and see what time suits them best. Um, so you'll have access to a live session with me every week. And in those sessions, we'll cover things like... Um, what does trauma look like? Polyvagal theory. What is fight, flight, freeze, flop, fawn response? What does it look like in you? What does it look like in your children? How do you know when you're in that overwhelm? And when you are in that overwhelm, how do you manage it? 
What does your sensory profile look like? What is self-care to you? How do you give your brain a rest? What would putting on your own oxygen mask really look like for you? How are you going to get yourself to a place where you do not lose your, where the wheels don't come off for you in this process? We've got some guests as well. So it's five weeks of live trainings and each week you get a DIY worksheet to accompany the session. So you can do a bit of self-directed study or self-directed learning and there'll be extra resources for each topic and we'll have guests. So for example, one of our guests is Kate Jones. Kate Jones is a neurodivergent psychotherapist. She's also one of the senior team at Neuroplastic and she's a transactional analysis trauma-informed therapist and she does a lot of work with neurodivergent children but also with adults and so you'll get five weeks of live trainings into that Facebook group but you'll also get access to an, a library of your own which will be hosted on my website so that all the recordings of the trainings go on there so you can access them again and again if you want there'll be a download for the worksheet you can go back and revisit them and you'll also be able to if you wish um, access them again in the future just go back to them time and time and time again so if you can't attend it live on Facebook if you're not on Facebook you'll still be able to access those trainings via zoom and again on the replay you'll get a DIY worksheet as I said every week We'll get um, a special guest every week, including the likes of Kate Jones. I've got a few, a good few people lined up for you. And you'll also get lifetime access to the course content by your own password protected in the online library. I am running that community. I, you will have me for those five weeks. So you'll have access to me for those five weeks. It's not unfettered access, uh, access but it's the, it's the most access I've ever given. I run a, a big group, which has four and a half thousand members and people who are in my group will see I'm in and out of there all the time, but this is a much smaller cohort. So it's an opportunity to work in a much smaller, more intensive way with other people who, who you know are in the same place as you are. I do wanna say it's not therapy, um, it is a therapeutic approach, but I am not a therapist. I'm not a mental health professional. Um, I'm sharing with you as a mental health first aider and a parent who has been through this process. So um, you may want to run this alongside other support for your own mental health. And when we are in the sessions and when we start and when I do the, the introduction, well, I'll do some signposting for you so you know exactly what to expect from me and what I can and can't provide for you in that group. This is what we intend to do with the Unstoppable Parent program. So it will give you an understanding of why your brain what does what it does and know that that's absolutely OK. It will give you some tools and practical techniques to help you self-soothe when you need to calm your brain a bit. One of the things that is the biggest challenge for me as an ADHD -er is I'm not medicated for ADHD and my brain is never quiet, ever. I mean, like my mouth is rarely quiet, but my brain even more so. I have a 100 things happening all the time in my head. And when you're in overwhelm and when you're stressed, that volume of that inner brain work can really get very overwhelming and exhausting. So what does it look like to give your brain a rest? What do those activities look like? I've got an EFT specialist and whoops, sorry, one button. I've got an EFT practitioner joining us for those who, who aren't familiar with EFT, EFT. EFT is emotional freedom technique. You might've heard it called tapping. It's when you're tapping on different points of your body and it stimulates the nervous system. It's a really good soothing technique for people who have sensory differences, but actually for neurotypical people too. It's something that I learned when I didn't know I was neurodivergent as a means of dealing with panic attacks. And the person that I'm going to bring in and do that with us is someone who's really well versed in supporting neurodivergent people and their families in how to use EFT to self-soothe and how to use it to give your brain a little bit of a little bit of space. And when we get onto the EFT module, I'll ask my son Theo to come and talk to you. He actually had some EFT to help him deal with a rat phobia. Um, and he now loves rats. He couldn't even say the word before. It's an incredible therapy and it's very neurodivergent, neurodivergent affirming. We'll also talk about how to get better at setting boundaries, pushing back when you need to, and not giving yourself such a hard time about needing to do that. And at the request, of one of my members, Sammy, there will be a certificate. Apparently that's a big selling point. When I said to people there might be a certificate, people got very excited. So there will be a certificate, but more than that, you'll get to be part of an exclusive community on Facebook. So as I say in Yorkshire, how much? So I've made it as affordable as I can. It's a five week training with at least two hours input specifically from me each week into that exclusive community. You can do it one of two ways. You can either pay in two installments of 90 pounds per installment. So it's a total of 180 pounds. 
you, when you do that through, I'll show you how to get into the payment platform, but when you do it that way, your first installment you pay now, your second installment you pay in two weeks time. It's set up as an automatic payment, but we will remind you that it's gonna come so that it doesn't take you over your overdraft limit. I know I've been there, I have ADHD. So when you pay in two installments, it's a total of 180 pounds, two payments of 90. You get full access to the Unstoppable Parent Programme. You also get an exclusive Q&A with me. That's for everybody that signs up for the Unstoppable Parent Programme. We'll do a Q&A just for the Unstoppable Parent cohort. And you'll also get an exclusive notebook with illustrations that Theo has made. So we're making a, a notebook just for Unstoppable Parents. He's made some new illustrations for me. My friend Kim is putting it together. Ooh, aye, aye, aye. My friend Kim is putting it together for us and um, that will be available to everybody included as a freebie from me. If you then decide, freaking stop pressing buttons, Heidi. If you decide you would actually do a one-off payment, it's a one-off payment of 150 pounds. So it's a little bit cheaper if you pay all in one go. Um, you get full access to the Unstoppable Parent Programme. As I've said, you'll still get your exclusive Q&A. It's a group Q&A with me. You'll get your notebook. But the other two things that I give people who pay all in one go is you'll get access to a, a webinar that myself and Kate Jones made, which is called the Surviving the Trauma of Broken Systems. It's two hours when we really deep dive into polyvagal theory. There's a bit of EFT in there. There's a bit of um, a bit of. Uh, neuro affirming and neuro safe guided meditation there's breathing exercises I don't know if anyone here did that when we did it at the time but you'll get free access to that and you'll also go to into a draw and someone who is uh, from the cohort who pay all in one go you'll get a ticket for a draw for a one-to-one -one support call with me I don't currently do those at the moment um because I'm overrun um but I do do them occasionally as a special one-off so that will be for everybody that pays in one go. So if you're like, I'm in, take my money. <laughs> what do I need to do? So this is a bit.ly link for you. Um, I will email it out to you. It's just put in bit.ly. You don't need a www, you just need the bit.ly forward slash unstoppable parent, all in capitals. We start next Thursday, the 1st of June. And um, between now and then, uh, when you sign up straight away, you'll get a link to the Facebook group. When you join the Facebook group, just be patient with us. We just need to check your name against the name that you register with. If, you're, if your Facebook name is different, we just need to make sure that you are the right people because we don't want people in, not that we don't want people in there. We want to make sure that only the Unstoppable Parent Cohort are in there. So uh, when you join that Facebook group, if you're on Facebook and you want to be in there, there is a welcome video from me and I will be in there between now and Thursday when we start. Uh, we'll poll to find out what time people want to do a Thursday evening. I could do seven, half seven, eight o'clock, whatever. We'll decide what works. Um, and I will also be sharing with, with you in that group between now and next Thursday, some extra bonuses. So um, you'll see me talking about the Unstoppable Parent Programme quite a lot for the next week, because, you know, why not? After all this work, I may as well keep talking about it. Um, but yeah, you'll see me talking about it quite a lot for the next week. Um, and I will be sharing with you in that group, in that community, how you can get some extra bonuses from me to help me spread the word about this that this piece of work that I'm really, really proud of. I'm really excited about. So the link Please, is... Can I just stop you very yes. quickly? The day is wrong on the slide. Ah, it is, yeah. Well done. 16th, Thursday the 16th of June. Thank you. I should change that. I'm not going to change it now. See, my ADHD wants me to change it now. There's a six missing. It's Thursday the 16th of June. Thank you, Amber. Um, it's next Thursday. It's a week tonight. So go to bit.ly unstoppable parent. We'll also send an email out to everybody and I'll be sharing it all over the place. You might have some questions. So if you have some questions, now would be the time to stick them in the chat and Amber will filter them for me. Questions specifically about the course or the content or what to expect. I'm more than happy to address any of that with you this evening. If you don't have any questions and you just want to go and sign up, then go and do that. I'm not going to stop you. But Amber, do you want to unmute Hello. yourself? How's the chat been? Has it been busy? The chat's been busy, been. but just general, mostly just general chat and lots of positive comments about how amazing it all sounds. So that's really good. Amazing. Um, just a couple of people are asking, um, is there a limit on numbers? So are there a certain amount of spaces? So currently I've made 100 spaces available. Um, if we have more than 100 people, I might make a second cohort. Um, but we'll see how the numbers are. Um, but yeah. I'm kind of aiming for a maximum of 100 people. Um, 
I can see the quest. Oh, people are saying the link doesn't seem to work. Oh, that's a good start. Hang on a second. Let me put it in here. Bit.ly forward slash unstoppable. So someone's asked, um, what happens if they can't attend the first session? So, so all yeah. of the sessions will be recorded. Um, thank you, Janet, for joining us. Um, all, of the sec all the sessions will be recorded and they'll be uploaded to your personal video. Um, and the, uh, the lives will be as available as a replay in the Facebook group. Um, so yeah, if you miss the first session, don't worry, you'll be able to catch everything on, on replay and there will be extra content in between the Thursday evenings. Um, people are saying they can't make it work by typing. Um, it is, it, but some, some, some people, people are working. saying it is working. Yeah. So, Paula okay. gets the Eager Beaver Award for being <laughs> the first person to have registered. <laughs> it's next to be certificate. <laughs> people are asking if they, they need someone to come and wash and bathe them I that's not a service I offer at this time um, I mean, well, I'm never say never, <laughs> never say never but you know if you saw the state of my kitchen you'd know why it's a good not a good idea to ask me to come and do your domestic chores although I do think there is a definitely a business for um uh, ADHD people swapping and tidying each other's houses I think that would be freaking amazing oh, yeah. um you were going to ask if there's a draw for a free stress toy but I thought that might be rude you know what I haven't explained but this is Jaffa he's our he's our company mascot and um, I will send a Jaffa to whoever it is that wins our one-to-one -one as well um Jaffa is a giraffe um because um <laughs> When I was doing some work with Jess Kane from Sem Family Instincts, her son misheard us saying giraffe draft check because she says draft check because she's very posh. And he thought she was saying giraffe check. Giraffe check. Um, so we had much, much hilarity. You kind of had to be there. Now that I'm saying it, I'm realizing it sounds, but it was hilarious at the time. So uh the giraffe came, became my patronus. And then what followed was a bit of an obsession with giraffes. So there will be many, many giraffe acts um, peppered throughout Unstoppable Parent Programme. But I will make sure that whoever wins the one-to-one -one gets a giraffe. Also, one like this, not a real giraffe. Um, you need to do the giraffe dance. I don't know what a giraffe dance is. It sounds dodgy. Interpretive. Uh, yeah, NVC is all about dress, nonviolent communication. And actually, if you go, when you go on the landing page to see um, the, the information that we've put on about the, uh, about the programme, you'll see the picture of Kate Jones. She's actually wearing a giraffe onesie that I had made for her. Maybe I should do that as a free draw. I'll have, have a think about that. I'll speak to the person that made that giraffe onesie. Oh, Harry's giraffe dance. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Harry's giraffe dance, which was actually just dry humping the air beside Jess's face. <laughs> Gotta love a PDA. -er. Has anyone got any questions about the cause? <laughs> um, just going to talk about giraffes. <laughs> There's a question. Um, is it predominantly aimed, aimed at EOTAS or more coping with the system in general? I'm yeah, not it's, not, it's not necessarily for parents who are asking for EOTAS. It's, about, it's for parents who are for parents whose kids can't be in school or who are experiencing difficulties with the education system. Um, so, yeah, if you are feeling like you're overwhelmed, um, and you're feeling guilty and full of shame and you need to give your brain a rest, that's that's what the, the course is for. It's basically a coping course for all of us who need it. Um, um, Zoe's asking, um, she wants to do it, but she thinks her husband would benefit more than she would. Um, let's do it. Can, can, you, both can do we it? both do it? Yeah, just buy, just buy one spot and share the login. I don't care. I, uh, I know that people won't take the mickey. That's absolutely fine. It's for families. So yeah, if there are two parents, do it together. No problem. Um, I'm looking to see if there are any other questions. Paula can't make the link work. We can, we'll, we'll have to look at it, Paula. Let me just, let me just, have... hang on a second. Let me just get the other link, which is the actual landing page link in case that helps. How do I do that? Stop share. Hmm. Have I stopped my share? Oh, look, he's just shared it in the chat. Have I stopped my share? Yeah. I have. Okay. I was just yeah. looking for the. Has someone just put it in the chat? Yeah. Yep. What a legend. Who's that? 830. Thank you, Dee. 
thank you so much. Yeah. The link um, is case sensitive, so needs it is to case capitals. sensitive. Yes, yeah, sorry, it's bit.ly forward slash unstoppable parent in capitals. I probably should have said that. Can we get this paid for in our EHCP as part of parent training? You can't, to my knowledge, but I am happy to give you a certificate so that when they say they're going to send you on a parenting course, you can say you've already done one. I'm happy to give you one of them. We're not CPD accredited, unfortunately, but I will hand sign it for you. Um, and I'll do that to it before I put it in the envelope. Um, but yeah, I'm happy to, to do that for you, no problem. That was one of the main reasons that I thought we needed this. Um, I had to get up to get my bank card. I'm proud of me. I'm proud of you too. Well done. Anything to stop the um, anything to stop the parenting courses? I'm so pleased. I was. I'll be absolutely honest. When uh, Amber came on earlier on with me, she was like, "I've never seen you this anxious." <laughs> I was really worried that people were going to like, I don't know, drag me out in the street and throw things at me and tell me that this was a stupid idea. Um, so I'm really pleased that no one's done that. Um, Emma's saying she's stuck on a 10 week course at the minute. Mm. Oh, a parenting course. Man, what is that? Jeez Louise. What are, gonna what are you going to learn in 10 weeks? Mine's, mine's proper meeting. I've got it all into five. 